Fighting Sail by Ryan Miller. There's a cold wind blowing, which is good because our ships wouldn't get very far without it. Today we are going to play scenario number, I think it's number three from the rule book. Looks like we got ourselves a convoy. Starting on the left hand side of the screen, you have, now this fleet, the Black Fleet, I built using the Spanish Armada army list from the rule book. You've got a first-rate flagship supported by two third-rate ships of the line, and they are charged with protecting these three merchant class vessels. They all have a little stripe of green on the mast or on the sails to help you identify which which is which. On the other side of the screen, you have a sort of a pirate fleet. The rule, the army lists in the rule book don't allow for any ships larger than fifth or sixth rate. That would present an unmanageable number of ships for me, so I actually gave them a single first-rate flagship using, um, boy, I think it's the Portuguese. Yeah, I just used the Portuguese and the point cost. All of these pirate ships are going to re-roll their boarding dice that come up as ones. That keeps it simple. Then they have, in addition to that, they have a squadron, two fifth rates and a sixth rate. And then one little, they got three little brigs here. They're going to kind of spit around. I'm not going to give you all the numbers right off the bat. The important thing to understand is that because I built these ships using the pirate army list, they have a better class of boarding than you might expect. Their boarding dice are going to be at like fours and fives, which they're going to need. The Black Fleet has three ships of the line that cost 225 points. They are given three merchantmen, and their goal is to exit at least two of them. They're going to be starting on this side of the table. they got to exit two of them from that side. The White Fleet is going to try to sink or capture two of these ships. If they can do that, they win. You also have the normal morale clock. Now, both of these fleets cost 225 points. The merchantmen were free. They have a morale clock of 22 on the white side. And over here, the Black Sails, they have a morale clock of 28. They get a bonus of six points because they're committed to ensuring that these ships get off the table edge. The wind, based the rules as written, they blow from these guys right to left. So it's going to be going in that direction. The difficulty that they have is that I have placed some terrain. Now, this is not according to the rules as written, but I like to add a little wrinkle when I can. Not in my drop cloth, a wrinkle in the rules. The wind may be blowing that way, which is going to lead these guys to want to race off in that direction, but they've got these shoals in the way and these these eyes. And as the video speeds up and we shift over to play-by-play -play, kind of rant mode, this is where I explain that I'm not going to show you this video in any great detail. There were some technical mistakes that are going to be an issue. I'll talk you through it. Here we have the Black Fleet that for some reason is sailing up into the wind, thinking that uh, they're, they're taking advantage of, excuse me, they're sailing with the wind. Remember, the wind is from south to north. And they're going to rush up and try to get into those islands as fast as possible so they can make their choice as to what to do. Um, the reason I'm not showing you this full battle and kind of doing a rant as I explain what you're watching is the White Fleet splits their forces. They're going to send their bigger ships of the line, their 5th and 6th Raiders to the north. Their capital ship with the Briggs is going to come down to the south. Now, while they do that, I want to explain a couple of things about what I've learned from this battle that I'm not showing you. And at a basic level, there was one too many fumbles on my part when it comes to how many dice to roll and recording whether it's successful or not. Remember that Age of Sail, this fighting sail game, sometimes it's a dice pool mechanic where you're looking to score successes. Sometimes it's four up, sometimes it's three up. You have exploding dice. They can explode on a five or a six or maybe not at all. And um, one of the problems I had is that I originally built the navies reversed. The white fleet was going to be protecting and the black fleet was going to be attacking. But then when I looked at the number of ships I have, I had to flip that around. And so got a little bit confused and wound up using the wrong stat line for the wrong ships a couple of times. Maybe not that big a deal, but when you're swapping out a second rate for a first rate, that's not really such a big deal. But when you're handling a third rate as though it was a fifth rate, that can be a problem. All of that can be overlooked. Lord knows you guys overlook that stuff often enough. Uh, a fact for which I am very grateful. But, you know, at a certain point it gets to be too much. And you realize this whole game is, is just not worth watching. Because there's just one too many. It doesn't really mean anything. 
On the other hand, I didn't want to waste all of the effort that went into this video, and I wanted to talk about something far deeper and something that, I, when it comes to things like dropped modifiers or misreading a stat line, I, you know, practice and, and getting good is all you can do. But there's something I can show you here that I think might help you with your wargaming, whether it's Age of Sail or not. And, and it all has to do with scenario design. And it all has to do with those islands. Now, I'm going to play this exact scenario out again, but I'm going to do it without the islands. I'll set it up. Black fleet on the left, white fleet on the right. Same thing. Everything is the same, except I'm going to take out those islands. Because ultimately, the islands are a bridge too far. Miniature wargaming is a hobby that benefits from a good-looking table. And in a sense... Having an open ocean table with no terrain lacks visual appeal. At least that's what the old Mr. Wargaming thought. After playing this game, I've come around to the notion that in some cases, minimalism is better for wargaming. And particularly with this style of play, this genre. One of my internet friends, frequent commenter Hethwill, pointed out over on Twitter, he said, hey, um... You know, when you've got a game like this, this Age of Sail, where you've got a blank canvas, and the canvas I'm talking about is not the sail, it's this open ocean. Both fleets are coming into this battle on an even footing. The only thing that makes any difference, the only thing that changes how your strategy uh, will be adopted is the wind. And the wind is universal. It's the same for both fleets. Particularly in a battle like this, again, absent the terrain pieces, where the wind is blowing from the south to the north, and whether you're coming at it from the east or the west, doesn't make a whole lot of difference. At that point, this kind of Age of Sail game begins to take on the aspects of a World War II dogfight, let's say. Or perhaps even a more pure analogy would be a duel out in the meadow, Two men, two pistols, two seconds, watching. You have a situation where the boys are on an even footing. There's a simplicity and an appeal to that that I failed to take into consideration. Now that it's been explained to me and I can see it more, we may see less of those islands. The islands are there as a... They, they can be useful as a balancing factor. Sorry for the tones there. I'm obviously watching this on a computer that is dialed in. Um, and I hope it doesn't distract you as much as it distracts me. The islands are a spice and they can be used to level the playing field, so to speak, if you're playing with uneven forces. The difficulty with this battle, and the reason I'm not showing it to you, is that you already have an uneven playing field in the sense that the white fleet has three goofuses, little one-shot pop guns that they have to protect and shepherd. They also are hampered by the fact that those ships of the line, they're only rolling two and three dice for their, their sailing points. They are large, they are awkward, and they are clumsy. They have to grapple with the fact that the ships they're protecting, they're rolling, I want to say, six dice. They're nimble, they're light. They have the potential to race on ahead and get out ahead. This is a real challenge for them. To add in a line of islands and to funnel them through a couple of little areas is one, uh, what would you call it? It, it? It's one hamper too far. It's, it's one, you know, they've already got their hands tied behind their backs in one sense because they're protecting smaller and weaker ships. To additionally tie their other hand in the back by saying, oh, by the way, you can only shoot through these couple of gaps here. That's a little bit too much, and it makes the, it slows the game way down, and it, it, it unbalances it greatly in favor of the Black Fleet. Now, we're not opposed to unbalanced scenarios here. You know, if the Black Fleet is, has the advantage, that's fine, but you need to understand that going in. And, and like I said, this would have been an hour battle, except that we abandon the purity and, and the simplicity of the age of sale on the open warfare. And and as you can see, so let's table that for a moment. Let's take a look. The 
the the third rates on the black side are starting to have their way with the smaller and lighter fifth and sixth rates, but they can't just unload. They have to be wary of the little ship. You can see the guy up in the northwest corner. He does have that little ship that's kind of hiding in his lee, waiting for a chance to make his sprint to safety. That's all going to depend on you know, what happens with this other pincher of the Black Fleet. And the little brigs, the, those are the guys down there in the south that you see moving right here. They're going to kind of swing around and come into the wind. They are much more capable of sailing while they are reaching for wind and, and even in irons and turning their broadsides as they so choose. The somewhat slower and less nimble second raider is going to turn to, and now look at that. We got a nice solid broadside on two of the ships that are meant to be protected. Unfortunately, in this battle, one of the things that happened is the first raider there over on the far left, he is stuck in anchors. He got a good run out, and then he just could not move to the rest of the day. At least until the battle was largely over. He was just sitting there, and so the the what would be protection of the convoy is just stuck waiting. And it's worth pointing out, he's not in irons at this point. He's not even reaching. He is running with the wind and just unable to get the successes that he needs to succeed. That anchor just just nailed him. By not rolling a four up on his two dice early in the game, he was largely knocked out of contention. And what's even worse is his bow is facing the enemy. The, the White Fleet knows that and they took advantage of it. But with his bow facing the enemy, he can't. Even, he doesn't even get the opportunity to bring his guns to bear. I'm a little unsure about the historicity of that and, and the gaming aspect. It seems to me that even if you're in irons, you should be able to pivot 30 degrees per turn, even if you're stationary. That really would have opened up his guns and made things, uh, 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 given him more options for this particular fight. We have shifted the, the focus here to the northern half of the battlefield where the white ships, um, and here, you, you see that little flash, I mean Black Fleet. I'm getting them backwards again. One of the things I'll do for the replay is actually sit down and rewrite my, my order sheet. When you're sitting down, I'm, I learn in a lot of different ways. I learn by writing. And when I write, the white fleet has X, Y, and Z, and I write the, the other ship has X, Y, and Z, then I imprint into my brain that the white fleet has X, Y, and Z. When I erase white and write black, that's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of information that needs to be, to be flipped. And that was one of my mistakes. So we'll we'll do this again. I'll reread out my order sheet. I'll actually make one. And one of the things that I like to do as a solo wargamer to keep track of this many ships, the game kind of breaks down. It gets harder to manage more than about five or six ships. So one of the things you can do if you're a solo wargamer, you're playing this at home, is write out one roster for the fleet that's going to be on the left hand side of the table. In our case, the uh, the the black. And I, I'm even getting it backwards on this. The black fleet is protecting the convoy. They're on the left side of the table. Put the Black Fleet's roster on the left side of the table. As you go through those first few turns, just even sailing in, you know, before the guns have opened up because you haven't closed within that, that 18 inches, you're reinforcing that, okay, black is on the left, white is on the right. And then when you get down into the more complex shooty phases, You'll already have that imprinted on your brain. You'll already have kind of trained yourself to think of black on the left, white on the right. And, you know, this may not be as important for you. Maybe you've got two, three hours that you can sit down and just take your time. And before you do anything, look at the roster. If you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder, if you're not trying to entertain, you know, if you're just looking to roll some dice, highly recommend that's the way you go. It can save so much time and, and just help. Uh, excuse me. If you are not trying to entertain, yeah, go ahead. Just make one roster. It's fine. It, it makes it easy, right? Whatever makes it easier for you. For a guy like me, or and, and I also bring that up because some of you guys may be inclined to do this for demo games. And if you're running a demo game or a convention game, you know, this kind of this is part of the logistics that you think of. And and maybe you don't consciously, you're not consciously aware of it. But yeah, when you have your fleet set out, okay, here's three ships to the left, three ships to the right, three ships to the center. Put the roster for those those three ships in front of those three ships. So when players belly up to the table, they don't have to wonder, oh, well, what if the one on the left is for the ship on the right? And what if the roster on the right is for the ships on the left? 
uh, it, it can make things easier. And, it, and of course, it'll help you because as the referee, you're going to have to keep track of all that stuff or, or at least be ready to assist other people take track of it. So getting back to the game, you can see that things have gotten pretty stuck in the uh, the convoy down to the south. The two ships have are, are trying to make a break, trying to run for safety. They're doing a pretty good job heading into the bow, you know, maintaining their position in the bows of the ship. And oh, we got we got a potential grapple right down there in the south. Right. White ship has moved in. They've launched their grapple. Oh, oh, it didn't work. They earned their anchor token, but the 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 cargo ship was able to immediately made a move, and because they were able to move, all they had to roll was one sailing dice, and they were able to slip out of the way. So unfortunately, no boarding actions there. Uh, the boarding, the increased boarding numbers for the white fleet don't come into play in this battle. They just didn't have time to get stuck in, and um, largely their guns were able to do the work for them. Again, you've got a, a second brig that's kind of wheeling around, looking for that shot. Finally, the sh that first rate over to the west, he finally gets the result he needs. And you're going to see uh, that as he swings his bow around and presents his broadside, he would have been happier if he'd scored more points to kind of get into the middle of things so he could launch two broadsides at once. But, you know, the, the, the fates just were not kind to him that day. He gets into the position he needs, and now what we have is a gunnery duel between the two big ships. And that, those are the dice that are dropping right here. We've got uh, a couple of hits from the the white flagship. that, And he's even got the assistance of a couple of brigs. And, uh, yeah, he's, he can even throw into... Now, that fifth raider has to attack on his own. He's not part of the squadron. But, but the black ship now uh, is able to launch its attack. Does he go for the guy, the little guy, that he has a really good chance of sinking? And, uh, or we will measure it. Nope. He's going to fire on the flagship of the attacking fleet. And he scores a lot of hits. There's a total of eight hits there. And this is the, the one that really sealed the deal for me. Eight hits, four saves. Wait a minute. He's got one more round. He can try to pull off the damage. No, it's five to sink him. Oh, that's a huge mistake. And, uh, ultimately the, the protector fleet wins this by sheer weight of morale and sinking the flagship, and that's about it I'm praying for you. So, like I said, we'll play this battle out again uh, without the islands and with a much better much better accuracy on our rules. Uh, and I hopefully I'll do that, maybe even tomorrow, just because suspense kills me. It's bad enough waiting for the rest of these campaigns. I'm praying for you.